Yeah, we can put a little bit in the Okay, thank you. Then we're just about ready. Recording has been started and the sound is adjusted. So, uh, welcome to this uh, third report. And uh, now we'll be um, to see a presentation of a very nice interface for managing servers. It's called Cockpit. And uh, to talk about it, we have Andrea Heizel. All right. Hello. So my name is Andrea Simpson, and I work uh, as a designer at Red Hat. Um, we have we we are a software company, um, and I would say a large bulk of uh, what we do is uh, operating systems for servers. Um, so yeah, today we're going to talk about servers. Um, yeah. What does a server look like? So this is a big server from Dell. Like they, they are these massive machines. They, they um, in big racks, like a lot of storage connected to them. And, and they usually live, they're so loud, these kind of late servers, that, that you usually put them in a very specific room where nobody else is. Um, if, you're a, if you're a server enthusiast, um, however, um, you can have them in your hobby room, um, but it does affect your hearing a bit because they are very loud indeed. Um, so you have to keep on talking like this, like all the time when you're around these guys. Um, but a server can also come in this form. Um, it can be a Raspberry. Um, you can hook it up and, and you can connect it to the network and just serve some files to your home. Uh, for just a, yeah, not much money. Um, this kind of server is the kind of server I have at home. It's like not too expensive. Um, we use it for a variety of, of things, like it serves media to our networks, to our other devices. Um, and uh, yeah, fairly regular server. It just sits in a closet and most of the time it just runs. This is what Linux look like. Um, welcome to Linux. This is what you get. Um, this um, is fairly um, powerful. It's very powerful indeed. I mean, yeah, the company I work at obviously makes a lot of money out of, out of selling this. And it's very powerful. But it's also fairly inaccessible. Uh, to people who don't do this eight hours a day, seven days a week. Um, and, and I believe that, that Linux should be discoverable and configurable also by people who are non-experts. Um, because that's the case today. Um, so a while ago I had a little issue with my server, so I, I uh, called a colleague who also works at Red Hat, so we develop operating systems. And uh, we had two disks connected to one server and, and a, a logical volume. Uh, we had a storage pool connected uh, to the same server, serving the same file system. And we needed to have it only on one disk again. And this ended up to be a several hours of work. We, we searched the internet and like, oh, but what command do you use? And first you need to run this command, the LV, LV extend and shrink the partition. And um, a bunch of work. And, and a lot of times we ended up blindly copying strings from forums. Um, it turned out well in the end, but it, it was a bit of uh, a hassle. I went and visited um, a company here in Gothenburg, uh, who, who, I mean, they run a lot of servers, um, and uh, they also had some issues with storage management. They had these papers printed out where it said the exact amounts they were supposed to write. Um, so it's like, oh, you need to do this task, then you write this command, and this command, and this command, and hopefully in the end it will turn out well, unless you press the wrong character in there somewhere. 
Um, so obviously, um, it's not just me and my friend who <laughs> has these issues, but also people who actually do this for a living. Um, because, yeah, these were actual citizens. Um, and, and this is a bit of a problem, I think, because if, if things are too hard, um, we will put things in the hands of people who, who make the things we want to do. So, yeah, okay, I want to share a file with someone in the same household as myself. Um, and what, what, what could I do? Well, I could, we could both sign up for Dropbox. I mean, we sit in two rooms next to each other. And then, and then send the files over Dropbox and route the whole green thing over the Atlantic Oceans to a server in North America and then back to Gothenburg. Um, and meanwhile, probably a lot of people are eavesdropping on um, the information we're sending. Um, and, uh, and, and I mean, and, and that's because, I mean, we, we were enabled to set up some easy file sharing at home, between two devices that are in our home, that are on the same network. And, uh, I mean, Google obviously have, have a solution for most of these things. And uh, it then becomes um, so hard and tricky to, to and then comes so easy to just go with that, to, to go with something that is obviously outside of your control. So, actually, for self-hosted servers, um, a lot of others around us, like a lot of other operating systems, have solved this in, in quite an easy way. Um, you can get a Windows Server 2012, and you're like, oh my god, Windows has a server, that's crazy, like, who would run that? Um, at my brother's uh, computer consulting company, they of course run that. Um, because not all of them, they're developers, they're programmers, but none of them is actually a sysadmin. So they have an easy, accessible user interface that they are able to, uh, uh, to, to just manage there and then, and it works well. The same thing with like, there's a product called OS 10 server, OS X server. Same thing for, for people who just have a small company. And, and they are able to set up easy file sharing between all the computers in a network. So, um, obviously there was a, a challenge that, that we set up out to, to address. And, and then it's a question like, how, how did we go ahead of this? So I think one important way to think about a server is, I mean, yeah, to do a car analogy, I think Compared to a regular laptop, which you sit at and, and you are you're using it heavily all the time, right there and then, and, and you interact with it constantly over several hours, um, for your own personal sake, um, a server is more like a bus. It's not for the driver of the server, it's, it's for the passengers. That, that needs to do things. So the whole idea is that for, say I have a file server, and obviously this machine's sole purpose is to serve files for everyone else, all the other computers. Um, so it's, it's for the passengers. Um, and uh, so that, that's obviously one goal, like just, have something that you're able to interact with, even if you only need to use it very, for very short periods of time with large times between. Um, because you only need to administer the machine when something goes wrong. Um, so obviously it, it needs to be something that you can quickly pick up and like, oh right, yes, this was what I was doing. Um, in contrast with something like Blender, which is highly specialized and uh, the whole idea is that for the UI, you sit in front of it like 
all day, and, and it's very, very, very effective at what it's supposed to do. So another goal for us was this thing just had to run. Regardless of what operating system you were on, on, on uh, how you were accessing it, um, for a lot of things, these, these servers, as we saw with Blade servers, they're obviously not in the same room, room as you, hopefully. Um, so you need to be able to access it remotely. Um, and let's see, so here we have, we decided to build a web interface that just runs, no plugins, no anything, and it just runs in your regular browser, uh, regardless of what operating system you have. So, I mean, I could run it on my, my laptop here, I could run it, if I wanted to, on my phone to quickly see if the CPU is maxing out or not, um, or on a tablet or on a Windows machine or something like that. Um, and when you log in, you get something like this. So we have some graphs on how things are doing on the system. You have some disk I.O., you have some network traffic, um, the CPU and memory, and making sure that none of those are going through the roof. Because if they are, you usually need to take action. Because things just need to run. Uh, we also set up some non-goals. Um, we, for doing centralized big uh, configuration management, there are obviously, obviously better tools out there. This is a one, one server at a time kind of thing. So for, for when you have a, a fleet of a thousand servers, you obviously, obviously do not want to use this tool. You want to, to use something like Puppet, where you set up recipes and, and it executes that and it kills machines or something like that. But then we're talking about things on a completely different scale. So we, I think for one machine at a time, uh, it has some, some things where you can use several machines at a time and, and jump between them. Um, but I would say, yeah, if you have 10 machines, then our tool is probably good. If you have 20, yeah, it's still a K tool to manage. We can jump between them and keep track of them. If you have 100, yeah, do something else, please. You should really, really use this. And the UI needs to be as annoying to use as possible at that kind of scale. That you really, really feel like, yeah, I should really try and use something else now. It, because, like, I obviously, this is growing out of hand. I, I need a better tool for this. Because that could be the case. I mean, you started a company with just 20 people and you had two servers, one file server and one database server, and that was fine. But suddenly you end up being a thousand person company, and obviously you then have different needs. So like we, we, we need to be able to grow with that all the time. Um, another thing was that since a server is supposed to focus on, it, I mean it has one job, it needs to serve the passengers of the bus and it needs to focus as many system resources as possible on only that. Um, any kind of configuration managed interface needs to be as low footprint as possible. I mean, we can't run an X server and we can't run uh, like window management and things like that, a lot of applications that on a regular laptop is of course very good, but on something like this would just take up too many resources. So the way we did this is when you launch this in your browser, um, uh, when you dial into that address, it kicks things in the background and it starts drawing graphs and it's starting to actually use some uh, system performance. But as soon as you shut it out, uh, as you close it, it's supposed to be with no footprint on the server. Like just a little demon that's a little agent that listens for any incoming calls there. But apart from that, like it needs to focus on its number one job and that is obviously not the management of the system, but on serving 
everyone. So another goal is that it should be able to play well with others. There have been um, management systems in the past, such as women, which took over your system in a way. You used it once and you set up certain things, and then you were stuck with that tool forever because, yeah, like all the disk management, configuration flags, and things like that was in that tool, and you were then unable to use it, to, to use the, yeah, the terminal or something else, right? Because a big non-goal of us is to kill the CLI. We cannot kill, like, the, the command line interface, it's excellent for a lot of tools and for a lot of scripting. It's very, very important. So that was another goal of us. Did, yeah, we, we should work alongside the command line interface um, because it could be the case that, so I, I am a, a newcomer as a sysadmin at a certain company and I, I have my colleague who's been a, a sysadmin for 10 years and he knows all the excellent commands in his sleep basically and we should be able to work together and we shouldn't like step on the toes of each other if he puts in a disk and, and he sets it up then that should reflect in, in, in the web interface. And the same way, if I do that on my side, it should reflect on his side. Um, so for example, here we have a screenshot. I hope you're able to see it. This is our um, uh, account management. And here in the terminal, I SSH in to the machine. And then I did add user, add man, and then he showed up right away in the UI there. Uh, and the same way, if I remove that user and you uh, run it around to list the users, it's obviously no longer there. Another goal was to keep it simple and straightforward. Um, uh, it's very easy to, to add new things in a haste. Um, and uh, it's, it's easy, again, to try and compete with the CLI tools which is obviously not a tool, not a goal for us. Um, because for, for some workloads, a command interface is just better. All right? So therefore, we focus on the basics first. Basic network management, basic um, storage management, basic service management, just stopping, starting, enabling or disabling down the boot or not. And another goal was to easy to extend. Uh, obviously, uh, we in the core team cannot think of every single case that you would run into on your servers. So therefore, we want to make it easy to hook in, um, hook in your specific tools. Um, maybe you run on a distribution that have different um, what do I say? Yeah, different uh, packages installed. Maybe you use another network library than we do, and then it should be easy to just swap it out for your preferred network library. Because it might be an embedded system where you don't have the space even for a network manager, and maybe you want to use yeah, ifconfig or uh, the systemd. Uh, very basic uh, networking stuff. And easy to embed it elsewhere. Uh, we made a couple of interesting pieces that were interesting to other projects. Uh, we have, and I will show a demo of this soon, we have a neat little embedded terminal. Um, and this was uh, apparently interesting to um, uh, for reuse by another product called Free IPA, which is an Active Directory uh, user server, uh, because they needed a a simple terminal to run, just run some commands in some cases, um, in their web UI for, for some tasks, um, and then they are able to reuse that single little piece of ours, and that could be the same for uh, the disk pane or the network parts. Um, we are, you will soon be able to actually use it for real, 
Um, so far, it's only been um, in development. Um, but with Fedora 21, they split up the uh, uh, distribution in, in three uh, separate products, which is workstations for general laptops, your general desktop, uh, server, uh, which you would then, which then comes with the cockpit by default, and also uh, Fedora Cloud. Um, and that will come out later in this year, so you will just be able to install it on your server. Um, and hopefully it will work fine and not cause you any issues. Um, but it's still early software, so um, yeah, a bit of a warning out there. Uh, Alright, demo time question mark, because I was uncertain if it would actually work or not. Um, let's see if I am in luck today. All right. Okay, here's the login screen. I don't know, a very simple password. Um, so here we see, uh, it's a bit screwed up on this slide, but uh, you can obviously see the running uh, CPU memory network traffic, and it started just as I logged in now. Um, it doesn't do very much right now, obviously. Um, okay, and you're able to join a domain for, for yeah, user management and stuff like that, and it doesn't help us change the post name. Alright, so the number one job of a server is to run services. Um, we can go in here, maybe, if we go to Docker container engine, and we see that it's running, it's possible to stop it, um, or start it, and also uh, make sure it runs on boot up, and uh, when it's under heavy load, you will see how much CPU, how much memory it's using, and also the error log here for everything that went wrong that I need to address. So it's all about finding the problems. Um, it could be that this service is taking 100% of CPU, and then I obviously need to kill it so it doesn't strangle the other processes on the system. We have a bigger journal here with uh, all the error messages. This is using the systemd journal. Um, we had a lot of luck that there is the systemd project um, because we were able to easily um, make use of everything they provide with us. Um, and yeah, we can go, go to certain dates, um, show how severe warnings, if it's just like everything it spits out, or just the most severe errors. Here's the networking card uh, part. I have um, three networking cards attached to it so far. Uh, this is using, uh, this is one of the number cards. It's possible to um, set the web type of, if I should use automatic DHCP and get the IP address automatically, or if I should set the manual IP, um, and also the DNSs and search domains under routes is possible to set up. And still, it's are using very little network activity right now. Uh, same thing with the storage here. We have um, some disks set up in array, um, and we have the volume groups here. Um, and the volume groups are obviously the same as I showed you earlier with all those CLI commands. Um, but here you have it here instead. This just have one disk in its storage group. See if I can find something that has more. Here is uh, physical volumes, just one. It's fine, I can add more physical volumes. See if I have luck with this demo. Yeah, and I just add more disks to this storage pool. Um, and I can also see like, okay, this, this guy here is almost running out of space. So I can add more storage to it. It, and any kind of errors goes here, and all the disks that are connected to the system goes on this side. 
Thank you. Thanks, sir. Here we have the Docker containers. Uh, Docker is a fairly new product, I would say, maybe a year old. Um, basically, it's uh, contained little systems that have very specific tasks. Um, so I'm able to look at the image. I'm able to run it here. Um, this is a WordPress. We just run the WordPress and we find this port. I can set some CPU roof on it here to make sure it doesn't act too bad to all the other guys. And then I run it. Okay, and then it sets up. I get an edit with a terminal here, which was why we actually created the terminal. So we were able to see how it's doing here. Sets up the WordPress. See if we are done already. I don't know what we do in working here. I'm glad this was the uh, part of the demo that obviously isn't working. When it's working, it's supposed to give you the um, give you a WordPress right here. But obviously, we're not that lucky today. So we're gonna stop this one and yeah, we can just get all that stuff here. <coughs> So what else do we have? We have the little embedded terminal. This is a neat little hack that obviously allows you to then use any kind of operating system uh, and you then get this terminal in the end and uh, you can even run MC edit on it. No, MC, the night better. Um, so in order to showcase how it plays well with the others, so if I'm going to switch over to the terminal here. I hope I am able to use this. Um, and here is the new admin. So it reacts instantly to any events on the system. Uh, and this is the same for everyone. Um, Here's the sidebar. Uh, we have some uh, basic functionality for administering several servers at the same time. Um, if you have three machines and you would quickly want to jump between them because you set up a NFS, you set up a disk with an NFS share or something on the first one, and then you want to access this on the second machine, you should be able to quickly jump between them. But as I said earlier, um, I try to design this in a way that when you have too many machines, it should be painful. Not painful, but not as nice as other better um, tools that are, are better for a massive scale. And yes, I think that was it. Let's see if I have anything more in the slides. Right, a roadmap of course, what we're planning. So obviously only the most basic things are in here and uh, we're planning a lot more um, stuff coming. Uh, I would say we're planning on some basic firewall configuration, making sure that what ports are being used where and uh, uh, also like just better networking tools support for mounting of remote storage, um, better service management, and uh, yeah, that's all I think. Um, and that was it for me. Uh, our website is at pocketproject.org. It's licensed under the GPL version 2.
Um, and we're more than happy to to have new contributors who uh, we can talk to you and see where we should go next and, and learn what, what people need for their systems. Um, and right now it's packaged for Fedora, but I would be very happy to see it packaged for other distributions as well. Um, because I, I think regardless of what distribution you're to, you choose to use, you, you should be able to uh, have easy administra administration of your server. Um, yeah, and that's my email. And thank you. Um, any questions? Yes, Sishan. So, um, does it have anything to do with the uh, Flink Commander project? Like, like com uh, controlling multiple servers? So, um, yes, I can repeat the question for, for the recording. Um, Sishin asked if it had anything to do with a product called Fleet Commander, which is also a Red Hat product. Fleet Commander, as far as I understood it, is mainly when you're a system administrator and you have a lot of uh, workstations uh, where you uh, need to set policies, you need to make sure that everyone Everyone with their laptops in the company, they use the company background, for example, or uh, they have certain uh, good defaults for when they first get the laptop. Um, so that is for laptops, cockpits is only for servers. So, what about multiple servers you want to Is it like you have to? Oh, if you want to. Yeah, it, so yes, what about multiple servers? If you want to manage multiple servers in a more template kind of way, so you set the same defaults on all of them, I would again set uh, we're not configuration management and puppets and those kind of tools is so, so, so much better than anything we could ever dream of achieving. Um, so I would certainly not try and compete with or even like give the impression that we're competing with those projects because anything we would come up with would obviously be so much worse. Um, so, but, but then also at the same time, um, we should be able to respect when something is using a, what is it called, a puppet template or a puppet recipe or something like that. A puppet manifest, yes. When a machine is using a puppet manifest, because maybe you set it up from there, we should obviously not try and override. <coughs> Excuse me. We should obviously respect that and not try and override it. Um, same thing if we if you join a domain and the domain has uh, a lot of the, um, what is it, Active Directory users. We should obviously not do local users beside that, but just disable that part of the UI. It's like, okay, I'm part of the domain. Obviously, all the user accounts are not on this machine. It's centralized. Um, so it's all about making sure that we respect <coughs> the environment we're in. That's it. Yes, Pastor. Uh, I was wondering, uh, could I get you to go back to the demonstration? I have a question about the section. Of course, of course. So, yes, he's curious about one of the sections. Oh no. It's related. To this is not even like, this is not even a checkout from, from the master branch. Um, okay. It's actually, so if you're wondering why it's a bit unstable, it's not a checkout from the master branch. It's it has a branch with, which is working progress on top of it. So I, I apologize for the instability. Okay. <clears throat> so I was wondering, in the services, um, yes. is it possible to see which services, like for example, comes with Fedora 21 server and which services I set up myself? Mm -hmm. Yes, that's a good question. So the question was, is there a way to see uh, what what things came with the operating system uh, as its base image and what things you added on top. So, 
On a regular Linux system, there is no distinction of what is the operating system and what is the, so to say, applications. It's, it's all installed in the same place and some of them come by default and some of them don't. Um, so we have no good way of, um, of telling that. If you are uh, this kind of person that runs everything as Docker containers, which is a new way of, of running services, um, we only run a couple of those uh, at home right now, so um, not everything works, obviously. Uh, then you have that kind of separation between what is the operating system and what is the services that you serve. Um, so unfortunately, we have no good way of doing that. I mean, theoretically, we could do a kind of blacklist or whitelist for what was in the operating system from the beginning, <clears throat> and what was like the thing that you installed with your when you ran yum install for the first time, but it's unfortunately tricky for very historical reasons, I guess. Um, but I would say things like like Docker try to separate those things where the operating system is one thing, the actual things that you run on top of the operating system, it's a contained little thing that is very separate from the operating system and obviously have less privileges to do things as well. <clears throat> yes? I have two questions. First, uh, how does it manage the server? Is it agent-based or it uses SSH to connect to the server? Or so the question was uh, how it communicates with the server. This is uh, a hard question for me because I'm not a developer. I'm only a designer. Um, so those things are a little bit above my head. I believe it's using SSH um, as far as I remember. Did you have a second question as well? Yes. The <laughs> we can also talk afterwards if you yeah. want to. Uh, the other question is the user management. So right now you logging with the root access. Is there any role based like okay, I have the root, but I give people because you you can manage con uh, Docker containers. So yes. I'm thinking about giving the permission to manage Docker containers to people, but they can't restart the critical server. Uh, services. Let's see if I go in here in change roles. Uh, obviously, I have server container and also container administrator. The reason I logged in as root is that we did a lot of refactoring of those parts just uh, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, so we're still working on making sure that uh, you can log in also as non root because. That is obviously better. So the idea is also that maybe you have someone at your office, which, as you say, uh, are, are is privileged to do only certain things. Obviously not to shut down the server and go home, but obviously to, to be able to spin up new services. So that, that's obviously something we're continually uh, working on. There are only two things here right now. We had five or six, but they were a bit hacked up. So we're going to come back to that as soon as possible. Uh, and the last question for here. Uh, how do you extend it? I mean, you said we can extend it to add more features. Is right. Like a plugin yes. So the question was, how do you extend it? This is obviously, again, above my league since I, I, I'm just, I just draw the pictures of how it's supposed to look and function and then I'm very lucky because I have two developers in my team who then takes those and just make them happen. Uh, let me see if I'm able to dig into the uh, source code here. We have a folder called P PKG here. Um, and the idea here is that um, it's separate folders. Um, you have a base, which includes the whole base of, of the UI. Uh, 
uh, and the base libraries, and then on top of that, you can have Docker, for example, which then contains all the Docker code um, that we use for, say, the shell has a lot of stuff in it as well, but you, the idea is that you could install a package on your distribution, which then in the install adds another one of those folders uh, where you have some hooks to the system, if you see what I mean. <clears throat> so you could write your own, I don't know, say you write a piece of firewall code and then you just need a couple of things you can pick up pick up a lot of our stuff as dependencies, and then you get a new thing. This is currently uh, very much a work in progress. I think the latest code for that landed like yesterday. So come back in a couple of weeks, and I think it should work better. Can <laughs> you talk more about Docker? Is it like this actual script? Docker, yes. The question was, what about Docker? How much time do we have, by the way? When do we need to be finished? According to schedule, uh, you have some time left. Okay, thanks. You know how much? <laughs> some time. Go on. Okay, thank you. <laughs> some time. Good. Oh, it's not shopping. Well, I don't want to hold up your you people like to avoid take your food away. But anyway, the question was on Docker. Docker. Uh, I'm not an expert on this, but basically. Um, it's a container that runs uh, a very minimal system that has just the thing you need. So Docker, I started up, it was probably an Ubuntu system, um, which shared the same kernel as my main system, uh, and then it had WordPress executed in there. Uh, you can read more about it on docker.io. Um, but it's just a, a contained little thing. I think it's fairly similar to some extent, but not at all also, to BSD jails, where things are very, like, the, the, the container can't hook into the, to the host. Um, and I think to some extent it's also being used in the same way that uh, a lot of people use virtual machines right now. A virtual machine that just runs one thing and that's it. Um, but obviously with a virtual machine you get the entire overhead of running the whole operating system of that virtual machine. Um, so it's kind of isolated process. Exactly, process. exactly. As far as I understood at least. For me it's just like, well, it's a thing you run and then you can start things, right? <clears throat> I saw that you installed WordPress inside the Docker. And it's a bit yeah, and then and then it does some specialized networking as well, so it gives you like your host suddenly act as a bridge and then you bind a certain port to its IP address of the container. Um, Yeah, so that's it. Um, feel free to grab me uh, around the conference um, if you have any more questions. Um, and feel free to reach out to me at any time. Thank you.